Good evening. Welcome to Fine Print with me, Molly Gampir. Here's wishing you all a very Merry Christmas. It's a season of joy. Children across the world have been waiting for Santa Claus to get them gifts this Christmas. But, it's not, but he's not welcome in one part of the world. It's not a Merry Christmas in China. The Xi Jinping-led Communist Party there has cracked down on the festival celebrations. The crackdown is seen as a part of the Communist Party's emphasis on tradition and the suppression of religion. Christmas decorations have been banned in at least four cities and a county. In fact, in China's eastern city of Nanyang, all the Christmas trees, lights and decorations were removed from a 27-story building within 24 hours. Now, this happened after government officials visited the building complex. China is an atheist country, so Christmas is celebrated there more as a shopping festival than anything else. China's crackdown on Christmas celebrations is not unprecedented. There was a similar crackdown in the year 2014 and 2017 as well. The latest move coming in the backdrop of the government's clampdown on a number of churches across the country. But not letting any of this dampen their spirits, thousands of Christians across China continue to celebrate the festival. To get in further perspectives, uh, joining us on this broadcast this evening is Andrew K.P. Leung, international and independent strategist from Hong Kong. Also joining us is senior journalist Ray Locker from Washington. Coming to you first, uh, Andrew, the ruling Communist Party, of course, has long feared uh, that independent worship might pose a threat to its dominance over daily life. And this crackdown comes under that larger framework of thought. But is there a reason why this year has seen a renewed push against the celebrations? Well, it's true um, that uh, um, President Xi has uh, recently emphasized um, cultural uh, confidence and cultural heritage and trying to ask the, the various uh, provinces uh, to prop up the uh, awareness of Chinese culture. But let's not forget uh, that China is also holding out um, 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 uh, uh, one uh, closer relationship with the Vatican, for example, recently. Uh, and indeed, there are over estimated over something like 100 million uh, Christians of different denominations inside China. But of course, most of them uh, belong to the so-called authorized uh, churches. Um, but um, apart from uh, Christianity, there, of course, there are other religions as well. Buddhism, for example, China embraced uh, Buddhism uh, from India, you know, thousands of years ago. And so, there are but, other religions as well. But why ask the Christians to not celebrate Christmas the way they would like? Well, I think that if you look at the, um, the news uh, report, uh, that only arises in a number of smaller um, towns or cities and and is i i can I, 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 as i read it um it's probably the the smaller province um uh, towns um their party secretaries uh wanting to score brownie points um and trying to exaggerate their political correctness but let's not forget if you go to uh, big cities like um um beijing and, and Andrew, Los, yes um, just, um, and, and people were attending mass very freely. So I think don't think that this is a national phenomenon, but this is a reflection uh, of an emphasis on um, national uh, kind of uh, cultural heritage. Uh, but I, th I think some, some small cities or towns are trying to interpret it um, in an exaggerated manner, I think. But you also cannot dismiss reports that uh uh, had earlier talked about the government's clamping down overall on the practice of Christianity, banning online sales of the Bible, uh, burning crosses, uh, removing crosses from multiple churches. Reports had also pointed towards those uh, incidents and um, uh, forcing at least half a dozen yes, uh, places of worship to true. close. Um, but I don't think that there is a, a, a national movement. Um, I think it's a question of, um, where, um, uh, where, as I said, some uh, party secretaries uh, trying to push them the kind of political correctness to the extreme. Um, but let's, as I said, let's not forget that uh, at the highest level, um, Beijing is holding out um, a kind of overtures uh, towards the Vatican and trying to promote um, or at least regularize the hmm. practice of Christianity inside China. And indeed, the number of Christians in China has been increasing.
Ray, uh, do you agree? And uh, many have been saying that this uh, might be uh, one of uh, the many ways in which uh, China is clamping down on the practice of Christianity. They're also calling it the most severe crackdown on Christianity in China in more than a decade. Do you agree uh, with the points that Andrew has been making? Well, I, I think I do agree. I agree that some of the people in the remoter areas are trying to uh, suck up to the leadership in Beijing by trying to score brownie points, by look, look at what we're doing to further your agenda. Uh, look, the, the pull of Christi Christmas is strong. It's basically a retail holiday here, even though it started out as a religious one. Many people still do observe it as a religious holiday, but primarily it is, you know, morphed into something that is more about giving gifts and expressing love and caring for family. And those things are hard to stop. So I think that's going to be a tough trend for China as it continues to be more and more integrated in the global economy. I don't think they're going to be able to stop it. Hmm. All right, we're going to leave it there for the moment. Ray and Andrew, appreciate very much for joining us with those perspectives. We'll, of course, keep, keep a close eye on the latest coming in from across China as far as the Christmas celebrations are concerned. But uh, taking you now to India, where it's a toxic Christmas for the people in the national capital. People in Delhi woke up to a cold, foggy Christmas morning with visibility dropping to 50 meters, affecting flight schedules and causing cancellation of over 300 trains. All departures at the Indira Gandhi International Airport in Delhi were suspended for over an hour as dense fog delayed 45 flights. The air quality in the region also remained severe for the fourth consecutive day as high humidity, low wind speeds and drop in mercury levels prevented the dispersal of the pollutants. 32 areas in the Delhi NCR region recorded severe air quality. China's capital Beijing had an AQI or air quality index of 184, which is unhealthy air. Contrast that with the air quality in some areas in Delhi, which was recorded at beyond 400. The air quality index of the national capital was 423 in the hazardous zone, as the minimum temperature was recorded at 5.6 degrees Celsius, two notches below the season's average. Experts advised against all physical activities outdoors and prescribed the use of N95 or P100 respirators when stepping out. Two days after a tsunami struck Indonesia, the death toll is steadily rising. At last count, at least 429 people were killed, but rescue workers continue to search through the rubble. More than a thousand are still account unaccounted for, and those who survived the catastrophe, life ahead is full of multiple challenges. Flattened buildings, uprooted electric poles, and damaged vehicles. This is what remains of a once bustling coastal community in Indonesia. As the country comes to terms with the calamity that struck late Saturday night, the search for survivors continues. Dozens of bodies were hauled away from buildings wrapped in bags. Blocked streets have hindered access to those stranded. Torrential rains added to the troubles of rescue workers. Many residents came to the rescue of the aid workers and joined in to search for survivors. Serang is one of the worst hit areas by the volcano triggered tsunami. In the Karita region of Serang, the catastrophe destroyed many houses and forced many residents to evacuate. But several of them returned to join the relief work. And for those who survived the tsunami, challenges pile up. Access to shelter, health care and clean water is becoming difficult. And aid workers are warning that medical supplies are fast depleting. Indonesia's coastal community is limping back to normal. But under heavy rain, sellers and fishmongers in Banten province struggled to do business. Stalls put up remnants of fruits, groceries and fish, anything they could salvage to make a little profit despite most residents evacuating to temporary shelters. But for a country that is so prone to tsunamis, a rumor of another one is worrying. Hundreds of people and rescue workers fled to high ground in the Somur village in Banthan province after a rumor about another tsunami. Panicked crowds ran through the streets, only to find out half an hour later that it was a false alarm. The worst is over, but rehabilitation and rebuilding poses a big challenge. And it could be months before these Indonesians go back to life as usual. Bureau report, Vion, World is One.
And Prime Minister Narendra Modi has inaugurated India's longest rail and road bridge in the northeastern state of Assam. The former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee had inaugurated the construction of Bogi Beel Bridge in 1997. The 4.9 kilometer long bridge over the Brahmaputra River will cut down travel time between Tinsukia in Assam and Naharlagon town in Arunachal Pradesh by over 10 hours. Designed like a bridge that links Sweden and Denmark, the Bogi Beel Bridge is India's only fully welded bridge for which European codes and welding standards were followed. A fully welded bridge has a low maintenance cost. The Bogi Beel Bridge is part of the infrastructural push planned by India to improve logistics along its border with China. The bridge will serve as a key military infrastructure for the Indian Armed Forces. It can withstand the movement of military tanks. The project took 30 lakh bags of cement, enough to fill more than 41 Olympic swimming pools and 19,250 meters of reinforcement steel. That's well over twice the height of Mount Everest.